Ding! Greetings all! Last Outrider here, bringing you part four of Who Are the Salamanders? This time it will be the final quest of Vulcan Hastan. And after that, I'm going to talk about why are they called the Salamanders at all? Probably the, the, the first argument I ever had about Salamander storyline is that. But now go on. Vulcan Histan devotes his every hour towards the recovery of the final four artifacts and the completion of the quest. It is written in the Tome of Fire that only when all nine artifacts have been recovered and restored to Nocturne Will Vulcan judge the salamanders sufficiently tempered? Only then will he return to lead his sons to battle. Hunting for relics is dangerous work. So far, the quest has claimed the lives of each forge father that came before Histan. It seems an impossible task. The Forge Fathers have been hard at work searching for many thousands of years. But the Salamanders do not begrudge this challenge. Rather, they accept it with the same stoic pragmatism with which they go about all their duties. In his searchings, Histan has visited alien planets, the abodes of traitors, and even the Immaterium, searching for that netherwhelm for traces and hints of his lost primarch. Often, clues are only revealed once such places have been scoured clean. And if the task is too large for Hastan alone, he will call for the aid of his battle brothers. The salamanders do not hesitate to bring their full might to bear at Hastan's command. They too would endure any foe and suffer any loss to retrieve the Primarch's gifts. For it is in his teachings that through hardship would come deliverance. The tempered blade is the strongest. And then a quote, Into the fires of battle, unto the anvil of war, Battle cry of the Salamander's Legion. Thus far, on Hastan's epic journey, there have been more false trails, more misreadings than successes. So it has been for every forge father before him. Yet, piece by piece, Vulcan Histan has built upon the knowledge and findings of his predecessors, and has further interpreted the Tome of Fire. He knows that he is on the right track, and that revelations are not given, they are earned. The path is not without pitfalls, and sometimes leads away from the quest itself. Whilst searching for clues in the Ultima Segmentum, Histan ran afoul the arch arsonist of Charadon. This began what the Salamanders call the Flame Wars, a ruling series, a running series of engagements that, by its conclusions, required the efforts of two full companies of Salamanders. Early on, Hastan had concluded that the trail was false. But by his actions, an Urk Orc Wag had been broken, and the lives of many Imperial citizens saved. Vulcan himself would not be displeased with such a result. Indeed, it was as if that was in itself a part of the test. Not all wars that Hastan has been involved in have been of his own choosing. Twice now, the Necron overlord, Trazin the Infinite, has instigated attacks upon Hastan. 
The Necron attempted to wrest the spear of Vulcan from Histan's hands, for he covets that technology, that technological marvel greatly. Indeed, it is widely guessed that Trazin was behind the demise of several forge fathers in the past, although this has never been proven. In a later plot, the ancient Necron had attempted to lure Histan into a trap during the Tokrin Crusade, but the stalwart forge father thwarted his plans. <laughs> okay, the next part is going to be called Aboard the Grim Scythe, but let's look at what they said here. Now, this is something that many people don't understand about the codexes, and that is they're not canon. All the books, all the codexes are written from a certain perspective, and that perspective is wrong when viewed from another perspective. So if you read a Necron's codex, it's going to view 40K from the perspective of the Necron. A Salamander's Codex, or Fluff, is going to view the 40k universe from the standpoint of a Salamander. And they all change. And yes, they're conflicting, because you have to look at the perspective, but people just don't get that. Somehow they're supposed to, you know, when the Ultramarines Codex comes out, which everybody bitches at Grant Ward about, and that it's highly Ultramarine specific, well, yes, because that's their perspective. Now, <clears throat> if, say, a Night Lord's Codex comes out, and it says the same thing, as the uh, Ultramarines Cordex, then you might think that's weird. But look at this here. So, for example, uh, we can obviously tell that this Necron is not coveting the technology of Vulcan. I don't, I just don't believe that. The uh, spear of Vulcan is more than likely a Necron Lord's staff of power. Okay, which, if you read the Necron codexes, are extremely personal items to the Necron lords. In fact, go watch my video on the war scythe. Just go do it right now, and you're going to know far more detail everything I'm about to say. It's a Necron war scythe. The warlord is trying to recover his war scythe. That's what I believe that is. Not a Necron overlord needs to figure out what it is. But uh, anyways, that's what I mean by his perspectives changing based upon who's writing the codex. So remember that anytime I'm talking about a codex, I'm going to be taking the perspective of the codex. Many, never mind. So now, why are they called salamanders is what I was going to talk about. Um... For me, this is uh, was actually kind of obvious, but uh, when I when I when I mentioned it to people twenty something odd years ago, they still just don't believe it. They think they're the lamest name of all the legions and everything like that. And I was like, no, because and I'm just going to give it to you now. Uh, I believe they regenerate. What? That's what a salamander does. It's not supposed to be a medieval title for a dragon. Uh, if they wanted to, they would have called them the dragons, but they called them salamanders. And I believe now with this new storyline uh, that this supports, supports that hypothesis. The reason why their chapter can regrow from 90 plus percent casualties so often is that like their Primarch, salamanders probably don't really die. We know, Volk, we know Primarchs pass along their genetic gifts to their, to their Legion members, to the other Ashtarte, so, so they're not going to be functionally immortal, I don't think. I do think, however, that they can regenerate, and that's why they're called the Salamanders, and that's why the Legion can regrow from 90 plus percent casualties, you know, 12, 15 times in a row. I think all you need is if you just have a salamander's head and throw it in a healing vat, you know, a year later, 
he's good to go. I don't, has anybody seen any uh, salamander dreadnoughts running around very often? So that's probably why they were still, they're still a legion, because they said, look, we regenerate. We don't need any successor chapters because we can control exactly how many numbers we want at any time because we either just let, they probably keep them in stasis, right? Oh, we need uh, 10 more salamanders. No problem. We've got a couple uh, arms and legs and heads over here. Just pull them out of, a, out of the ice box, put it into a healing tube, and boom, a few months later, a salamander is reborn. They could still have people even from Istvan just, you know, popping them out from the age from 10,000 years ago, just from deep frozen and then regenerating. That is my theory whenever I was playing Rogue Trader. That's how I um, interpreted the salamanders. I hope people like that. Until next time, which will be, as I said, the, uh, what was it? What did I say? Oh, aboard the Grim Side. Bye. Mm -hmm.